Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's been a couple of months since Starship Flight 4 demonstrated its ability to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, showing that the heat shield on Starship did in fact work. Albeit not perfectly, but good enough to bring Starship home. It didn't in any way demonstrate Starship's aspirations to be rapidly reusable, but this is still a test program. One of the things that is supposed to make Starship rapidly reusable is a heat shield which doesn't need huge amounts of maintenance between each flight. Most space capsules use what's called an ablative heat shield. This is a heat shield which is designed to recede. As the heat comes in, it causes chemical reactions which release a gas that produces a protective layer. There is a chemical reaction which is absorbing energy from the re-entry and therefore protecting the vehicle using the least amount of mass. The space shuttle, on the other hand, couldn't do that. It had to have an entirely passive thermal protection system. This wasn't designed with any chemical reactions in mind. It would merely stop the heat propagating through the surface to the aluminium structure underneath. And this, of course, was famously problematic, with the tiles being very fragile, falling off, and, you know, even... If it was perfect, there was still processes they had to do after landing. For example, there was a waterproofing process which had to be reapplied for every flight, and that took a minimum of 72 hours. Other examples of this kind of heat shield are the X-37B, there was obviously the Soviet Buran, and Starship. And in many ways, Starship actually has a slightly easier time than those other vehicles, which are made of aluminium. Starship has a stainless steel and can handle much higher temperatures underneath, although even then you have to consider that while the melting point of stainless steel is very high, there may be metallurgical changes which happen at lower temperatures. So anyway, the question I want to answer is, how do you actually make a substance which is sufficiently low thermal conductivity that there can be thousands of degrees Celsius on the exterior and relatively normal temperatures immediately underneath, less than you know a few centimeters away. You need to work with materials which have very high melting points, things like ceramics and glasses made of silicates and borosilicates. But on top of that, you have to manufacture them in such a way that they have really low thermal conductivity. And finally, they need to be very light because you're going to be coating your entire spacecraft in a few inches of this material. And a lot of these problems are addressed by the microstructure of this material. That is the deep, your know, microscopic internal structure which makes this up. So there are three different ways that heat gets transferred. One is by thermal conduction. That is where you heat one end of a solid object and the heat will tend to flow along it to the other end. And you can actually measure the thermal conductivity. That's a, you know, that's a physical property that objects have. The second kind is convection, and that is where you heat up a fluid and the fluid flows to the new location and carries the heat with it. Finally, there is radiation, that is where you heat an object up that it starts to glow initially in the infrared, but eventually it becomes visible. And the emission of that light, that electromagnetic radiation, will cross the gap, even if it's a vacuum. That is why the sun can heat the earth, despite the space between us being, well, space. So if you put heat shielding tiles from the space shuttle under a microscope, this is what you see. It looks like a mess of strings all kind of jumbled together. But most importantly, there's a lot of space. Like something like 90% of the volume of the tile is space. And that means that it's very, very light. And this is an early example of the shuttle heat shield. Later on, they had an improved version. And again, it looks like lots of little fibers kind of laid out with lots of space between them. And if, say, you found a tile from a Starship launch and put that under a microscope, you would find something very similar. But I'm not going to show you a photo of that because the person that did that has since taken down their YouTube video because they were concerned about things like ITAR and trade secrets. And so this kind of microstructure is used because it's incredibly good at stopping heat flowing through the system because it inhibits all three mechanisms, so conduction, convection, and radiation. Let's start with convection because it's actually the one that is most affected by this. The majority of this is empty space, 
and on Earth it would contain uh, air. And sure, that would actually be a pretty good insulating technique because it would stop the air moving particularly quickly. But in the tenuous upper atmosphere of the Earth, there's almost no gas in here. That space is almost entirely vacuum. So for almost no work, they've effectively eliminated convection. And even although you do have atmosphere from the outside, as soon as it sort of gets in, it slows down and that is lost as a mechanism of heat transfer. So now let's think about thermal conduction. With conduction, you have a cross section, and the wider your cross section, the more energy can flow through that. But also, the further the distance it has to travel, the longer the heat will take to get there. And so this kind of microstructure wins in two ways. As you can see, the structure is mostly thin little fibers, so it the conduction cross-section is very narrow. The majority of this is empty space again, so the cross-section in any layer is a fraction of the actual cross-section. But also, because these are kind of interlinked and interwoven in a random mess, uh, it's not a straight line from one side of the tile to the other, so the heat has to conduct through a convoluted path to reach the other side, and that slows down the conduction. And so that really leaves you with radiation. And radiation tends to be the least performant way of moving heat around. And that's why you can look at a pot of boiling water on the stove and not burn your eyes. But if you try to pick it up or stick your hand in it, you're going to be in trouble. Thermal radiation generates photons. The amount of photons, the amount of energy goes as the fourth power of the temperature. So if you double the temperature, you get 16 times the thermal energy flux. And so when portions of this internal structure get hot, they emit photons which cross the gaps, and that's primarily how heat is getting transferred through these tiles. But apparently they chose these fibre sizes because the diameter of these fibres is about one micron, which is comparable to the peak wavelength at the peak heating temperature, which means they are exceptionally good at scattering these photons and making it very hard for them to progress all the way through the material. So the manufacturing process for this started out with like glass fibers, which would be mixed up and turned into this kind of wallpaper paste like material, which was, you know, 90% water. And then you slowly squeeze out the water until you had a tile of the correct density. That would then be placed in a microwave oven and then heated to temperature sufficient to sinter the glass fibers together to give it some structural strength. Then after that, it gets machined to the correct shape for its location on the orbiter. And then a thin impermeable glass coating is applied to stop uh, things like water and other stuff getting inside the material. And then this is baked one more time to solidify that coating. Now during the space shuttle's life there was actually a couple of different iterations of this. The first one was called LI-900. It was all uh, silicate glass and it was called 900 I think because it was 9 pounds per cubic foot. And later on, there was alumina enhanced thermal barrier, and this was made of a bunch of different fiber types. There was zeosilicate glass, there was borosilicate glass, and then there was uh, alumina, which is actually uh, sapphire fibers. And this also included changes to the surface treatment. The early version was, it was a glass coating that ended up sort of sitting on top of the fiber structure. Later on, you had something called Tuffy, the toughened unified piece fibrous insulation. Uh, and this was a slightly different chemical process that would penetrate further into the fiber structure and it would also leave like porous voids and stuff in the surface, which meant that it was ultimately stronger because it was thicker, it was better integrated. And those tiny pores that were left, those would actually shut down cracks as they began to form. So it made the material less brittle. And more recently, this evolved into tough rock. It added oxidation-resistant ceramic to the surface, and that stopped atomic oxygen in space from attacking the surface chemically and causing it to degrade over time. Now, there's another important process in the tile design and maintenance, and that is basically because these have so much porous void space in them, they naturally absorb a lot of water. And if there's any rain, like if the shuttle's rolled out and there's rain, it would just soak it all up. And that would be a problem because not only would it make the tiles heavier, it would you know, obviously reduce the performance of the space shuttle, but then once it got to space, the water would expand, it would freeze, it would crack. That's not good. So they have to apply a, a material, a treatment to make it hydrophobic. And this was a long, tedious process which would involve injecting a liquid chemical into the spaces between the tiles and where it would be absorbed and then it would off-gas this uh, sort of toxic alcohol. So for 72 hours, pretty much, you had a team 
in respirators working on the shuttle to re-waterproof the shuttle after every flight. During the re-entry, the heat would actually remove the uh, water-resistant properties. The chemicals would basically get baked out. And so that does lead to a question, what is SpaceX going to do about this? SpaceX have set up their own uh, facility for manufacturing their tiles. We don't actually have much of a window into what we're doing. You know, NASA delivered patents and uh, all sorts of technical papers. We haven't really seen much of that stuff coming from SpaceX. I, it's pretty obvious that they're using very similar techniques. We've seen photos, uh, images of the microstructure, and we've seen chemical analysis that shows that they're pretty much using the same kind of materials the Space Shuttle did. And people who have recovered tiles from the sea have noted that they have actually resisted the water. They tend to be pretty dry. But those tiles that have been recovered close to the launch site, those are the ones that have come off of the spacecraft, which never made it to orbit, which never performed a re-entry. I'm not aware of any tiles that have been recovered from the Indian Ocean so far, but maybe it's only a matter of time. At this point, I still think that heat shield maintenance is going to be the biggest barrier to making a rapidly reusable starship. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.